Hello again everyone. In this video we're going to give a different characterization of integrability. It's not too far off from the original one, but it's a little bit easier in practice to apply. Now, uh, as you've seen the entire semester, uh, when I'm writing down these convergence definitions, uh, ultimately I like to use something I call the inspired choice theorem which allows us to not have to worry about having some multiple of epsilon. Uh, in this case I'm just going to put it right into the statement of the integrability criterion so that we don't have to prove it as some separate uh, case. So here's our theorem and this is the integrability criterion. All right, so we use our normal function from the closed interval a, b to the reals. We assume that f is bounded. So all of the suprema and fema stuff we might need to talk about will exist. Okay, so the statement is that the function f is integrable. Of course, again, we're talking about Darbo integrability here. So it is integrable if and only if. All right, so here comes the condition. So first, uh, there's going to exist some positive real number k. That's not what is usually written into the integrability criterion. This is the inspired choice k. Okay, such that for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists, ah, now we've been doing all semester for all epsilon, <laughs> there exists something, and it could be an N, uh, could be a delta, but this time it's not going to be either of those. In fact, in this time, it's actually going to be a partition. In fact, it'll be two partitions. Uh, in our textbook, they just use one partition, and, and we'll have a little bit to say about that uh, a little bit later on. But for now, we're just going to write down two partitions. And strictly speaking, these depend on the epsilon you choose. But I, I'm never going to be writing that epsilon. It just <laughs> the notation gets too cumbersome. So I'm going to have partitions uh, w and x. And w also will depend on this epsilon. Uh, and these are going to be partitions of the interval a, b. OK, such that, of course, there's got to be a such that. What's the restriction on these partitions? And it should be that the difference in the upper sum of x from the lower sum of w is less than epsilon. So integrability, remember, told me that my lower and upper integrals were equal. But those lower and upper integrals were defined in terms of infima and suprema of upper and lower sums in some order. So this gets us back to that. We don't have to worry about the infima or the suprema of all those. We just need to get some upper sum and some lower sum close enough for every epsilon. Okay. So I'm going to give a proof of this, and, and we'll do an example where we prove it in, a, in the next video, or, or where we use it, rather. Uh, okay, so uh, there's two directions, of course. We need to show that if f is integrable, then this, this weird condition holds, and then if the condition holds, then f is integrable. So first, uh, we'll assume f is integrable. Okay, uh, now we need to prove, well, there's going to be a K that pops up out of this, but we really need to prove for all epsilon, well, something, something, something. So the first line then really has to be let epsilon be greater than zero. Okay, fine. Well, because F is integrable, then what? I don't know, the lower and the upper integral are the same. Uh, that doesn't seem to be useful right now. Uh, but let's see. Here's what I can do. I know that the upper integral, which I, I mean, I mean, I know something about it, right? It's equal to lower integral. I know that this is equal. It's equal to the infimum of all of the upper sums. So let me use a z here, and I can run through all the z's in p. Okay, so I know this, and and here's the idea. This infimum 
cannot be too far away from the upper sums. Yeah. So if I say I knew all my upper sums, right, were up here, but that the infimum was down here. There was some big gap in between them, right? Well, if that was the case, then any one of the numbers in between all these UFs and the inf would be lower bounds and greater lower bounds at that than the infimum. And that's not allowed. So you give me an epsilon, right? And say, oh yeah, you can't get any upper sum within epsilon of the infimum. I say, well, that's nonsense, right? The infima, the infimum has to get as close as I can possibly want to at least one of these upper sums. Okay, so the same thing would be true with the lower integral and the supremum of the lower sums. I have to be able to get some lower sum as close as I can possibly want to the actual supremum. So that's how I'm going to build these X and W partitions. So we're going to let X and W be partitions such that, well, let's see first, the difference between the upper sum and X and the supreme, or the, rather the infimum of the upper sums, which is just the upper integral, is less than epsilon. Okay, of course, the upper sums are all bigger than the infimum, so that's why I'm writing it in this direction. And if I, well, now if I take the lower integral and I subtract the lower sum of W, I can get this to be less than epsilon. Okay, so again, because the lower integral is just a supremum, and I know that I can get the supremum as close as I want to the set of all lower sums, I can find some partition such that the lower integral and this lower sum are within epsilon of each other. All right, now, this is where we can use the integrability. Okay, F integrable implies that the lower sum is equal to the upper sum. Oops. Okay, and so what does this imply? Well, let's look at the difference between the upper and the lower sum, one on X, one on W. I'm gonna play the add zero game, right? In fact, we're going to probably want a little bit of room, so let me oop, we'll move this down here. Okay, I want to play the add zero game, and, and at first it's not going to look like the add zero game, but you'll see it really is. So I'm going to subtract the upper integral. And then I'm going to add the, well, I'm not going to add the, oh, I said upper. I'm not going to add the upper, I'm actually going to add the lower. And so it feels like I'm not doing the add zero trick. It feels like I'm messing it up a little bit. But I'm not, because the previous line tells me that the upper and the lower integrals are equal to each other. So this piece here is actually just zero. All right, so now I sneak some parentheses in. And I look up above. And I say, oh, look, the difference between the upper sum and the upper integral is less than epsilon. Ah, nice. So this is less than epsilon plus, and up above, the difference between the lower integral and the lower sum is also less than epsilon. So this is less than epsilon plus epsilon, which is two epsilon. Now we go back and what was our goal? Our goal was to show that if f was integrable, then there existed a K such that the difference between U and L applied to some partitions that we could find was less than some epsilon we gave, right? Oh, we missed a K here. Ah, ah, we want to put a K there. Ah, okay, because look what we have. <laughs> That's the K we need, right? Our K in this case is two. Yeah, so we can actually uh, even find a, a partition so that the difference is two times epsilon. Why not? Okay, now we want to go the other direction. So in the other direction, so conversely, OK, 
Okay, we want to prove integrability by assuming I can find partitions such that the difference of the upper and lower sums is less than, say, some k times epsilon. Now, the goal is to show that f is integrable. And if f is integrable, that means that the lower and upper integrals are equal to each other. So to do that, we're actually going to go back to something, uh, well, we, we worked on a little bit in, in class, which was showing the following. Um, if I want to show that two real numbers, a and b, are equal, this is equivalent to showing that the difference between a and b is less than epsilon for all epsilon greater than zero. Now, this wasn't a big surprise going from left to right, right? If a is equal to b, then the difference between a and b is zero, and that is definitely less than every epsilon. The surprising part was maybe going the other way, right? If I can show that a and b are within any small distance, then they actually have to be the same real number. All right, so in order to show that the upper and the lower integrals are equal, I can simply show that they differ by less than epsilon for every epsilon. Okay, so that's actually going to be the strategy here. So our first line then is going to be let epsilon be greater than zero, and we need to show that the upper and lower integral differ by less than that epsilon. Okay. Now, <clears throat> now by our assumption, right, once we're given an epsilon, then I know there exists this k and these partitions so that I can get the upper and lower sums within k epsilon. So there exists some k positive and there exist partitions x and w such that the upper sum of x minus the lower sum of w is less than, well, I should be writing k epsilon. Yep, that, that'd be kind of the first way I want to do this. But I want to get rid of that k. And so since I can do this process of finding partitions x and w for any epsilon, I'm going to choose them so that this difference is less than k times epsilon over k. And if I do that, then of course these k's cancel, and I actually get that the upper and lower sum differ by something less than epsilon. Okay, cool. Next, uh, let's look at the difference between the upper and the lower integral. So thus, now if I do the upper, oops, there's our upper integral minus the lower integral, Of course, there's a reason I'm doing the upper minus the lower, which is that we know from a couple videos ago that lower integrals are always less than or equal to upper integrals. So as long as I put the upper integral first, I know that this difference is going to be non-negative. Right? So, and then I don't have to worry about this absolute value that's popping up here. All right. Now I know, though, that let's put this on a little, maybe on a little number line. The upper integral, the upper integral is the infimum of all of these upper sums. So if my upper sum for, say, x was over here, then I know that the upper integral is going to be somewhere to the left. But we also know that the upper integral is bigger than the lower integral, so that will be a little further to the left. But then we know that the lower integral is the supremum of all the lower sums. So it's the supremum, so it's an upper bound, so it's bigger than, say, this LF of W. Okay, of course it could be equal, but it's certainly not going to be smaller than it. And so here's the point. I know that the upper sum minus the lower sum, that's this big chunk here, that is less than epsilon. So if I take something in the middle, namely the difference between the upper and the lower integrals, 
that also has to be less than epsilon. And there we there it is, right? We've shown that for every epsilon greater than zero, the lower and the upper integrals differ by something less than epsilon. So this implies that the upper integral is equal to the lower integral, and that implies that f is integrable. Huzzah! Okay, so in the next video, we're going to use this integrability criterion in order to uh, start proving some stuff. Hey, how great would that be? All right, we'll see you next time.